Hey, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're on to the next chapter. It's uh, chapter uh, 28. It's called Special Relativity. And if you've not been exposed to this material, uh, you're in for a real treat today. Uh, it is uh, different. Uh, and um, there's just no way to describe it. It's just, it's just different. And in fact, I would say it is so different that most people at first just like, don't believe it. It's like this is just this crazy thing. Uh, the world doesn't work that way. And you'll see why, uh, hopefully, when we put it all together. So give it time to sink in. But uh, we call this uh, chapter and going forward modern physics because there's just an amazing number of discoveries in what is often referred to as the 30 years that shocked physics and from 1900 to 1930 there's just some different behaviors uh, that uh, just kind of doesn't fit our intuition right and that's because on one side and this is what we're going to do today is what happens when you're going really really fast and then, of course, what happens if you're really, really small? And see, these are the worlds we don't live in. And so it doesn't fit our intuition. And it seems weird to us. But let me just begin. As weird as it may feel, all of our science is grounded in empirical science. Uh, that is, what do the experiments tell us? And in fact, that's kind of where I'll begin. Because what we're about to do, like I said, is a real surprise, a real treat, and really an intellectual journey by Einstein. And it's just an amazing journey, but it is logically sound and then backed up with an experiment. And so we're like, okay, it works uh, apparently. A little surprising, uh, but it does. And of course, like I said, experiments, and of course, I'll just even mention the GPS satellite system, would not work if what we're about to say wasn't true, even if it does seem a little bothersome. So what are we doing uh, today? It's called Special Relativity, and so chapter uh, 28. And it's referred to as special relativity. The relativity is the word I want to focus on. The special is here because it's a special case. Uh, Einstein's thinking, as we'll talk about, is, is a case where we as an observer are not changing our velocity. We're not accelerating. Uh, more on that as we begin. But let me, let me just start with the relativity here. Relativity is a word that hopefully is not too surprising. Sometimes we get lazy and think relativity has to only do with this Einstein fancy stuff. And, and that's not true. I want to begin with just kind of focusing on that word relativity. Maybe, maybe I'll stand about an arm's length from the door, maybe a little more than uh, the, the board, a little, maybe a little bit more than that, and, and just ask this, how far is it to the door? Now, for you guys online, that's kind of probably hard to judge because you're watching it through a, a video camera. But I just want to say from my perspective, I'm about one meter from the board. From the camera's perspective, oh, there's probably 12, 13 meters here. So if I'll take the camera as being you as the observer, if I were to ask you how far is it to the board, you're going to say 13 meters and I'm going to say, no, it's one meter. Uh, and then you go, well, who's right here? And I just want to point out, it's not like one of us is right and one of us is wrong. It, it's just, what is the distance from our perspective? What is it relative to us? And that's what we mean by relativity. There's not a right and a wrong. It's just, how would it look from a different perspective? And that's probably the easiest one to do. Uh, but there's a lot of relative perspective. I'll come over here and grab a, um, a, a meter stick here, right? And, and if, I, if I held this meter stick, you know, vertically, and maybe if I tilted my head 45 degrees, uh, and we ask, okay, is the meter stick up and down with our eyes or not? And from your perspective, you're going to say, well, yes, it is. And from my perspective, it's going to say, no, it's not. 
Of course, you might look at me and say, well, it's not because your head is tilted. And uh, I might look at you and say, well, no, 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 the, the meter stick and your head is, is tilted. And so this fancy word relativity is really just saying, how would it look from somebody else's perspective? It's, it, it's not a comment about which one is right and which one is wrong. It's a comment of how does it look from that other perspective? And better still, if we know how it is viewed in one perspective, could we get it in the other? I'll, I'll go back to the distance of the board. If I am one meter away from the board, I could say I am one meter from my perspective. Of course, you're going to say it's 13 meters from your perspective. And knowing that there's about 12 meters between me and you, I could probably figure that out. I could go, well, look, I'm going to say it's one meter, but I know what that person over there is going to say. That person's going to say it's 13. That person is going to say, well, of course it's further away because they're further away. They're 12 that way and the board's one that way. I add them together, that's, that's 13. So even though I'm only one meter, I could figure out what your perspective is. I'm not saying yours is right or yours is wrong or mine is right and mine is wrong. I'm just saying I can figure out mathematically, I could connect them together. And as simple and as trivial as that may sound, that's really the foundation here of Einstein's thinking. So let's talk about Einstein's thinking and let's introduce you some, some uh, modern science, some things that you might call kind of bizarre. Uh, I call these the first three steps here the three bizarre consequences of relativity because they're just going to seem a little foreign to you, a little bizarre. Uh, but I also need, of course, justify them and go through Einstein's thinking. Uh, let me come over here. I just realized I need to turn on the uh, display here so I can get started with this uh, chapter here. But I like to use this phrase. Everybody knows Einstein's brilliant. Okay. But I'm going to go a step further and say he's not only brilliant, he's bold. Because he's going to follow his logic no matter where it leads. And if it leads to some bizarre things, and it will, three bizarre consequences right away, and then we'll see other ones, we're just going to accept it that, hey, he's bold, and he accepts it. And of course, many other people don't, at least at the beginning, until the experiment and the technology is able to catch up to Einstein's advanced thinking. All right, so I'm going to start the chapter here where it says special relativity, but I'm going to scroll down kind of in this first page and get to an important little piece that your author points out here. Uh, let me make it maybe a hair bigger here. But I think the best place to start Einstein's thinking is to say, What's going on at his moment in, in, in history in the terms of, of science? And, and, and the reason this is so important here is because most people would say something like this. Take a laser beam. You, you take a laser beam and you, you, you shine it on the, the whiteboard here. And you say, okay, when you turn on that laser beam, how fast does the light travel? And you know, we'd say, well, it travels the speed of light. We did that in the optics. It's three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That's how, that's how fast light travels in a vacuum. Oh, okay, but what if I was now in a spaceship going really fast? Let's say half the speed of light that way. And I take this laser beam and then while I'm in the spaceship I shoot it forward and I ask from your perspective how fast is it going and most people will get this one wrong most people say well, that, well that's pretty obvious look you're moving along at half the speed of light and then pushing off from you is, 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 is a laser beam at the speed of light so from your perspective you would say it's one and a half times the speed of light I mean it, it left your laser beam at the speed of light but you were in a spaceship going half the speed of light and as logically as that might seem it didn't match experiments at all 
Einstein had three important experiments. And your author only talks about one of them, and so maybe I should move on out of these very fancy experiments. But one that's referred to as the michelson moray experiment measured the speed of light at different times of the year as the Earth would go around. And so they could get different speeds to the Earth, and yet every time they measured the speed of light, regardless of how fast they were moving on the Earth, regardless of which way it was spinning, what latitude they were on, where they were in terms of the orbit of the Earth, they always came up with the same number, that the speed of light was 3 times 10 to the 8th. And that seemed a little bizarre. And this is what it's saying. It's saying that if I'm in this spaceship and I'm moving along and I fire this laser beam, from my perspective, it goes the speed of light. But interesting enough, from your perspective, it seems to go the speed of light also. And that just doesn't fit right with the current thinking in 1905. It probably doesn't fit well with your current thinking of the physics you've learned up to this point. It's like, well, shouldn't we add them together? I mean, nobody would say this. Nobody would say that I have a baseball and if I throw it while I'm in a car going 40 miles an hour and I throw it at 20, of course, from my perspective, I would see it moving away at 20. But from your perspective, you would say, well, it's 40 plus 20. It's 60. Nobody would say it's still 20. That just seems weird. And I admit, it does seem weird. But if you will bear with me, I'm going to start off with saying there are three wonderful experiments, this being the first, and the only one I'll mention, is that empirical science seems to tell us something different. Empirical science seems to tell us that, hey, the speed of light, no matter how fast you're going, if you take this laser beam and shoot it, you're going to see it go the speed of light, and everybody else watching it is going to see it go the speed of light. Now, I admit, that seems a little bizarre. So that's why what we call a postulate is what Einstein's going to do. Uh, I think it's down here. Uh, it is the second postulate. It just simply says this. Einstein's going to start his thinking with what I call empirical evidence. He says, look, the speed of light is C. It is a constant, and it is independent of how fast the observer is moving. So all observers see it going at the speed of light. Now, I'm going to say it again. I know that seems a little bit weird, but if you're a true believer in science, it's what we call empirical science. Whether we like the answer or not, that's what the experiments are telling us, and that's what Einstein is going to do. And that's why I say Einstein was not only bright, he was bold. He's going to say, look, this may seem weird that every observer sees this laser beam going at the speed of light. And if that bothers you, so be it. Let's just start with that as a given condition. And so let's call it a postulate. And so without trying to explain why this happens, Einstein just says, let's accept it as being true because if it is true and it's bothering us, it really means there's a lot of science we don't understand. That's why it's bothering us. And he sees this as a golden opportunity to discover something very new, something very radical. He, he also goes on to say, maybe it just seems weird to us because we've never really traveled close to the speed of light. We don't really understand that world. We don't have that gut physical intuition of what things can happen when you get close to the speed of light. So of course it bothers us. And we don't even know the physics that happens up there because we've never been there. And so Einstein says, this is a golden opportunity to really discover something new. We've got empirical evidence that really doesn't make sense. That means there is something wrong with our thinking. So, here's where we begin. Postulate number two. Speed of light, keep that in mind, speed of light is going to be C no matter who's watching it. You, me, a third person, a fourth person, doesn't matter. They could be in a spaceship going fast or slow, doesn't matter. They see it the same. 
Now notice I skipped postulate number one, so let me backtrack here because another important piece of Einstein's thinking is postulate number one. And postulate number one, it just simply says here, the laws of physics are the same regardless of what reference frame we're in. Uh, what he really means is this, is that again, if I am on planet Earth moving through the universe at some unknown speed and I drop a ball and it falls because of gravity, I would get the same result if I wasn't moving and I just dropped the ball. See, the ball falls because of the Earth and it has nothing to do with how fast the Earth is moving. And so every experiment that I can do would never, never tell me how fast I am moving. And so it's kind of like being in a car. I don't know if you've ever been in a car and maybe in the back seat, maybe when you were younger you had a sibling and, and maybe even you were bored on a long trip and so maybe you played catch with a little tennis ball back and forth. And I will tell you that you played catch in the same way that is if you were sitting on the couch in your living room. The fact that the car was going 75 miles an hour down the freeway didn't matter. You just kept playing catch with it because the laws of physics didn't matter whether you were moving at 70 or you were at zero in your living room. And of course, when you were in your living room, you weren't really at zero. You were on the earth moving at some horrendous speed through the universe. We, you, we don't know. We can't tell because the laws of physics would all be the same. All right. So Einstein takes this as a reference of then whether something is moving or not is just relative. Uh, that means if you came at me, I might say, hey, you're coming towards me, but the reverse would be I'm coming towards you. So from your perspective, I'm moving towards you. From my perspective, you're moving towards me. But the reality is we can't really tell or say which one is moving. We can only say relative to each other. We know we're closing the gap. But whatever experiment I would do would be the same whether I was moving towards you at a constant speed or just not moving towards you and you were moving towards me. There's just no way to tell. And so, like I said, you're in for a big treat here because Einstein's going to take those two basic principles and run with it and begin to say, hey, for these two basic principles to be true, and I'll point out they're based in experimental evidence, so it's not like he's going off the deep end and just kind of like, I'm going to make up my own universe and how it behaves. It's No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the behavior of the universe as we understand by experiment, knowing that we don't know how it behaves, and see if I can figure out how the universe actually behaves, and so maybe the universe would make more sense. And so he starts his thinking. <laughs> And the first thing that he comes up with is this thing called time dilation. Uh, let's talk a little bit. Here, here's, here's kind of his thinking. I think your, your author does a really good job here of showing a, a nice little picture of Einstein's thinking. Uh, he's got the two observers and so let's have this discussion and, and one observer we'll call the astronaut. And so here's the astronaut in the space shuttle. And let's just say he's going really fast. Okay. Now the other observer, uh, your author says, is this person on the earth. They're looking and watching this space shuttle go by. And what happens in the space shuttle is this. There's a little laser beam, they call it a light source. It sends a light up, it hits the mirror, bounces off, come back to a receiver. Okay. The distance between the light source and the mirror is D. So the total distance traveled by this light source is 2D because it goes up and it comes back. So from the astronaut's point of view, you would come over here and do something like this. You'd say, okay, from the astronaut's point of view, I would say C, this 
speed of light, because I'm doing a little laser pulse, is equal to 2d over the time taken. All right, so, so that's from the astronaut's point of view. Let's talk about somebody who is on the Earth. And that's why he gives this other picture here. See, from the person on the Earth, as the space shuttle is going along, the light is going up, and so you have both a vertical and a horizontal motion. And so this observer says, well, the light pulse didn't go straight up. It kind of went along an arc, which your author calls distance S, hits the mirror and bounces back down and goes another distance S. So let me put that on the other board. I'll put that right next to it. And a, the, uh, the, uh, the author here would say, all right, if I take the speed here of light, uh, no, I guess I don't want to do that. I want to do, I don't want to use the symbol C. I want to say the distance traveled is 2s divided by the time taken. Now, as I compare these two, without Einstein's new thinking, you might say, well, I've got no problems here uh, because clearly the 2D is smaller than the 2S. And we're both watching them and they take the same amount of time, right? Or do they? See, here's Einstein's brilliance. Let's for a moment just go back to before Einstein. You might say, oh, they're the same amount of time. And then what you would get is a number here that is greater than the speed of light. And this would be back to what I'll call old thinking, where somebody with a laser beam would say, if you took a light beam that's in the space shuttle and the space shuttle is moving, the person on the outside would see something greater than the, the speed of light. And everybody was happy with that until Einstein said, well, that's really not what the experiments are saying. Uh, they're saying that they should come out to be the same value for the speed of light, regardless of who's watching. So Einstein says, maybe what we need to do is to realize that maybe there's a different time frame for each of these. And that way they could still come out to be the speed of light. And so what if I set this equal then to C? And so the first little step here is to point out something quite new, quite different, and quite surprising that Einstein notices right at the beginning if two different observers see that light beam moving at the speed of light, Yet one of them sees a greater distance, then the, that one who sees the greater distance also has to see a different amount of time in order to get the speed of light to come out to be the same. And so Einstein, this is his brilliance. And like I said, his boldness. He looks at this and says, you know what? This could happen. As weird as it may seem, we could have the speed of light be the same for all observers if you're willing to accept that time is also relative. In other words, the time that I see elapse is different than the time you see elapse. And not to say one is right and one is wrong, not to say we can't get a mathematical connection between them, but what you call the elapsed time and what I call the elapsed time is relative. Wait, 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 this is worth repeating. Let me go back to where I started this video lecture. This video lecture started with saying, what's the distance to that board? And like I said, 
From my perspective, it's one meter. From your perspective, it's 13. We got a different number. I'm not saying each one of us is right and one of us is wrong. I could even say I could figure out what you would say it is because you're 12 meters further from me. And that's how I know you're going to say it's 13 because it's one for me and you're 12 more. And so I'm going to add those two together. And so the distance to the board is relative. The angle of that meter stick is relative. <laughs> Time is relative. The elapsed time that I perceive could be different than the elapsed time of somebody else who's moving. And that's the brilliance. And Einstein just accepts it. Well, that, that, that's clear. That, that's just it. It, it. Time is relative. And that's how nature is. That's how it works out. That's the amazing new discovery. And so let's see if we can get a mathematical connection. And I got to admit, when somebody hears that for the first time, they're still kind of stuck in their shoes going, oh, what? <laughs> time is relative? Well, I'll let it keep seeking in for the rest of this lecture, but yes. And so Einstein begins to realize that there would be a time frame that would be relative to the observer. And because of the motion going on, these time factors must depend upon the relative motion. So if you're moving fast, you would see one moment in time, and I'm moving slow, I'd see a different moment in time. So let's get some numbers between this. Because like I said, that might just sound weird, but that one might explain why I'm also giving this a T naught. Uh, this is actually referred to then as the proper time. Sadly, that word almost makes it sound like, though this time is right and that one is wrong, and I want to keep emphasizing, I'm not saying one time is right and one is wrong. Uh, what I am saying here is we've got a new dilemma. I mean, not only do we have the fact that time is going to be different for different observers, but now we have this dilemma of how do we discuss time? We need to have some kind of uniform uh, pattern because time is different for every observer. Now I'll come back to the board again. If I'm one meter from the board, and of course you're 13 meters from the board, somebody else can be 25 meters from the board, we can't just simply ask, what's the distance to the board? Because it's what's the distance relative to which observer? However, we can do this. We can pick a standard. Uh, let's say the standard is this front row. And so this front row will be two meters away. Now, I don't observe two meters, but I do know this. That if they, the front row, observe two meters, then I can do a calculation from them to me and figure out what I have. And likewise, I can do a calculation from the standard to you to figure out what you're going to measure. And I can do a calculation from the front row to the person who's, what I said, 25 meters away. And so I need a standard. And so this is our standard. We call it proper time. Like I said, probably not a good word because it almost implies right or wrong. But it is extremely useful. Uh, I would put it in a chart like this. I would say, if I know the time that elapsed as measured by the proper time, I could then calculate a non-proper time. How does the other person observe it? And if here is a another person over here that perhaps is moving at a different speed than this one, then of course their time's going to be different. But if I have a standard place to measure everything from, I could then calculate what that person sees. And so if I call this person A and this person B, but I'm person C, I'm the standard. And uh, that standard then can be used to then calculate what other people measure. And so that's going to be our goal here, is to say, once I know what the proper time is, I can then calculate the non-proper time 
and see how much time elapses for anybody else. So, coming back over to here, here's going to be our definition of proper time. The definition of proper time would mean that if you're measuring an event, the beginning and ending of that event happen at the same place. In other words, if I was watching somebody run a race and I had a stopwatch and they start here and I go start and they stop there, stop, I would not be recording proper time. Their starting and stopping places are different. I would record a non-proper time. Proper time is recorded when they're at the same. So if this runner would just start here, go all the way around the track, and finish here, aha, now that's different. They started and stopped in exactly the same place. And then I would measure their proper time. So, coming back to this little experiment, you can hopefully now see why I gave the astronaut the notation of proper time. Because the light beam left the laser, hit the mirror, came back to the receiver, and the receiver is right there where the light initiated. So the light started and ended at the same place. But for the person on Earth, the person on Earth sees the light initiate, which would be slightly to their left. As the light goes up and comes down, they hit stop when the light is slightly to the right. So it went from their left to the right. They measure a non-proper. So there's a lot of non-proper times, but there's only one proper. And so this is what I call bizarre consequence number one. Bizarre consequence number one is the time by different people, different observers, is different. Not, not to say one's right and what's wrong. And not to say we can't get a mathematical connection between them. In fact, that's where I'm going with this. I'm going to follow Einstein's thinking and his first thought right here is that these times must be different. That is the only way you're going to get the speed of light to be the same. And that's what the experiments are telling us. And so Einstein's going to use that to run through a little bit of math to figure out what is the mathematical connection. And that way, if we know any time, whether proper or non-proper, let's say we know a non-proper, let's say we know the time by person A is non-proper, we can then use that to calculate what somebody in the proper frame would see. And then we could use that to calculate what somebody in frame B would, would see. And so we can get any other non-proper by first starting with a non-proper, figuring out what the proper is, and then figure out the motion of that other person. So, all right, so let's go through the algebra. And the algebra is not too bad, but it does have quite a few steps here, so let me begin. So let me start with this equation. Maybe I'll just move the delta t to the other side here and write this as 2s over c. Uh, let me come back over here and do a little Pythagorean theorem here. But if you take a look at this, this s being the distance up to the mirror at an angle because of the space shuttle moving from this observer, we would say that it went up a distance d, but it went over some distance. And if we're calling delta t the whole time, let me cut the time in half, take it by the velocity of the space shuttle here, and that is how far we would go. So let me write it this way. The square root of d squared plus l squared. And so there is the l. How far does it go just when the light goes up to the top of the mirror? And then I can put in the value of l by saying it would be the velocity of the space shuttle times delta t over 2 and square that and divide by c. And here's where the algebra kind of builds up. I don't like square roots, so let's square everything, okay? So delta t squared equals 
And if I square everything, this is going to be a 4 over c squared. That's probably the easy piece. But then I'm going to have a d squared plus a v squared, a delta t squared over 4. If I do the distributive property, I'll have 4d squared over c squared. And then over here, I guess I'll have a v squared over a c squared. Uh, bringing in the c squared, I guess I'll also have the 4. Uh, I'll also have the delta t squared, and I'll also have the bottom 4. So I've got a 4 on top and, and bottom. Those are going to cancel off. Uh, let me do one more step, well, a couple more steps. But this one in particular is interesting because I'm going to jump all the way back to here. If you were to rearrange this as proper time being 2d over c and square it, proper time squared equals 4d over c, isn't that what I have right here? So I'm going to write then proper time squared. And I'm also going to cancel off a 4 and have a v squared over c squared delta t squared. Well, it looks like I'll need a little bit more work to finish the algebra here. But I will say, I hope you're getting the gist of this first bizarre <laughs> consequence of insisting that the speed of light is the same for all observers. And so it looks like well, what I get here, and I'll just put the delta t squared from here. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take this one and move it over. So this becomes a minus v squared over c squared delta t squared equals to proper time squared. And now you can see why I was doing this. You can see uh, uh, Einstein's thinking. That we now have a mathematical connection between the proper time and the non-proper time. Let me keep doing the algebra. Delta t squared 1 minus v squared over c squared equals to the proper time squared. And then I will go delta t squared equals proper time squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared. And now, just to get regular times without the square, let's take the square root of everything. So delta t equals and it looks like this would be 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared times proper time. And this, I won't quite put a box around it, but I will pause and say, all right. In what I'm saying making sense so far? See, you have to have different time frames or what I'd call relative times is a necessity if the speed of light is going to be the same for all observers. And then if you set the speed of light equal like we just did, you can go through a mathematics and say, oh, so, so this is the mathematical connection between the two. Not a surprise, hopefully. Can you see that it depends on how fast the other observer is moving? Remember that V is the speed of the space shuttle. Now, I should point out a couple of things here. Number one, to make it look a little simpler, we like to do this. We like to say delta T is equal to and we like to take this 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared and call it a gamma factor. 
and call it delta T. So in other words, gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. And so what you're about to see in this chapter is this same factor keeps showing up over and over and over again. There's, there's something about that factor that until Einstein, nobody really knew about. And because of that, we like to give it its own little symbol. It makes it easier for writing the formulas. So this right here is what we call the time dilation formula. But of course, you can't actually calculate it until you know what the gamma stands for. And so those are the ones I want to put the box around. The, this box is saying that I would have different times for different of the observers depending on what gamma is. And I want to point out a couple of things. Starting with even something like a car, but even going as fast as a space shuttle, how fast is, say, a car compared to the speed of light? Or even the space shuttle compared to the speed of light? International Space Station compared to the speed of light. All these are incredibly small. And it gets even worse if you take a small number and you square it. Like take one half and square it, you get one quarter. Or take one tenth and square it, you get one hundredth. And so if you take the speed of a car and you divide it by the speed of light, you have like point zero 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 zero. I don't know how many zeros. And square it, you have even more zeros. Here's my point. My point is, Einstein's brilliance is right here that the world that we're used to, one minus small, very small, let's say ignorable, so that's a one. Square root of one is one. One over one is one. Gamma is one. And so right here, Einstein's main point being is that we live in a world where things move slow compared to the speed of light. We did even not even know nature had this extra gamma factor in it. We just are so used to saying, hey, if somebody's in a car and if somebody's on a train and if somebody's in, in a classroom, they all measure the same delta T's. But Einstein is pointing out, it can't be that. You may not notice it until you get close to the speed of light. That's why our experiments that were measuring the speed of light were giving us weird things and nothing else was. And so Einstein, I'll say it again, is both brilliant and bold because he's going to say the world, when you get close to the speed of light, behaves a lot different than you and I have given it credit. We've always just assumed that the change in time is the same, whether you're going fast or slow. But now, this is the new piece. And like I said, it's bizarre. I get, I get it. And so it's what I call bizarre consequence number one. And I do want to point out that this gamma factor, having this weird velocity in there, is probably worth looking on a graph for. Because gamma, as a function of velocity, and if I put here the speed of light, and I put here the number one, unless you go about 10% the speed of light, it still is pretty close to one. And the speed of light is incredibly fast. And so, other than light itself, and some other experiments that were starting to go on during Einstein's time, well, we don't really understand this piece of the puzzle. And so you will also notice in the mathematics that this has an asymptotic behavior. In your algebra class, you would call it a pole. In more advanced math class, you'd call it a singularity. But what it does is it eventually becomes a noticeable number, a big number. And you've got to get closer to the speed of light. We, oft we often say you've got to get at least greater than 10% the speed of light or you're not going to notice it. And that's where I want to start here. I also want to then take this as an opportunity to say that, hey, if this bothers you, you weren't the first. 
<laughs> he, even when Einstein comes up with this, he's bold enough to believe it himself, but nobody else is. They're like, no, 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 no. This, this is crazy thing. He even publishes all this and nobody pays any attention to him. It's just, no, 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 no. It'll take a while. It's just too revolutionary. However, in years that follow, and your author does a good job of this, he says there are many experiments being done, and I think your author talks about the muons coming in from outer space somewhere in here. Uh, maybe I'll just say yes. Oh, there they are, right there. Is that some early scientists, somewhere in the earliest part of the 20th century, realized we have a way to test this for Einstein. Uh, we have a way to say that out there in the cosmos are these little tiny particles coming in called muons. Now that's a whole discussion in itself, so let me not go down that road. But as science advanced and they begin to discover a lot of other weird, crazy little particle stuff, uh, we learned about these cosmic rays, and so here we have these muons here. And what was interesting about them is they are what we'll learn radioactive. They decay. They don't live very long. And in fact, they should not be able to live very long to travel a given distance. And yet they were. That made no sense. But the early scientists who knew Einstein's work said, wait a minute, isn't this a an example of time dilation? In other words, let's come over here and look at the math. The reason we call it time dilation is because this factor gamma is always greater than one. See this graph? In fact, maybe I should put that on the board. That will help your thinking. The factor of gamma is always greater than one. If it's only equal to one, we feel comfortable with it. That's low speed. But at high speeds, it becomes a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. Let's just say for the sake of discussion, it's really fast and it's a factor of 10. What this would say is as somebody observes it with motion involved, and that would be us, right? We would, we would see the muon moving through the atmosphere as it comes in from the cosmos. And the little muon might say, oh, I'm only going to live for one second. Now, in reality, it's much smaller than that. I think this, this even says what it is. Yeah, see, these muons only live for 1.52 microseconds as measured by them. And of course, measured by them means that's the proper time. They're not moving to themselves. They're just saying, I'm not moving. How long do I live? And that's my lifetime. 1.52 microseconds. However, if you're going fast enough, yeah. and I'll just pick on the number 10 for a second, but if you multiply this by a 10, this now, instead of being 1.52 microseconds, it becomes 15.2 microseconds. It lives 10 times longer, and that's why it travels much further and is noticeable to the early scientists. And so they, they said, this is it. This is the answer. Now, they don't quite go that fast. In fact, as long as I have this example up here, I think your author actually then does the calculation and comes up with a gamma factor of, here it is, 3.2. And so he says if they're traveling 95% the speed of light, they will live 3.2 longer in our reference frame. And so that's why they seem to travel so incredibly far. So I want to say it again. As bizarre as this might seem, notice it's rooted at the beginning in the michelson moray experiment, empirical evidence, and it is confirmed by this little experiment. Now, in recent times, we've done even much better because we actually have very accurate atomic clocks. And I don't think your author talks about this, but scientists have put very accurate atomic clocks on airplanes fly them around the world and land them again. And they have two clocks. One stayed on the tarmac. The other one flies in the airplane around the world. They look at them 
and they don't keep the same amount of time. In fact, here's a good phrase to remember. Look, look at the one that would give you the lowest value. Remember, gamma is always greater than one. So the one at rest is always the lowest one, right? Here. Uh, I, I didn't say that well. Uh, I want to say it then. The clock that's in the moving object. So if you're not in the moving object, you're over here. You're watching it move. The moving clock would run slow. And so a very useful phrase here is m m running clocks run slow. In fact, your author uses this as a fun discussion. It's called the twin paradox. And so here is his little diagram of the twin paradox. You have these two twins here. And it looks like we've got two women. I'll put her in her mid-30s and say, all right, they're in their mid-30s. And one of them gets on a spaceship. The other one stays on Earth. And the spaceship goes taking off really, really fast. So fast that the time elapsing by the one in the spaceship is slower. Moving clocks run slow. And so after traveling in this spaceship after a certain number of years, ooh, that's got to be a careful. Certain number of years I was measured by whom? Remember, this is the whole problem now. What time are we measuring? Who's doing the observing? And so after a bunch of years, let's look at the time as measured by the two individual people. The moving clock would run slow. And so it kind of looks like the one in the spaceship comes back and the one in the spaceship is maybe just aged a few years. And so instead of being now in their mid-30s, they're in their late 30s. But the one on Earth is looking more like she's in her 70s. They did not age at the same rate. And now let me just emphasize this because this can get overlooked. People go, well, isn't time just something that humans make because we make clocks? I mean, when something runs slow, it, my clock runs slow, it's just because the batteries are low, right? No, 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 no. That's not how we in science define time. Time is a physical principle, just like mass, just like force, just like distance. There's a certain amount of time for the Earth to go around the sun. We call it one year, and we can measure it on a calendar that, that, and of course, if we call it one year, that's not something humans invent. We invent a measurement for that time. But the quantity time is something that's part of nature. The sun, I'm sorry, the earth goes around the sun, or the electron goes around in an atom. And so, no, time is a physical quantity. Whether it's humans or not, whether it's clocks or not, there is still time. And that's what this twin paradox is. Well, I better move on because there's so many things to show you. I just want to take this first one kind of on the slow th side of things because, like I said, it is, I think, a little bizarre feeling for people at first. Well, let's keep going on because I told you there was a little, a bunch of these, and there's three fundamental ones and a bunch of others. So I'll move on to the next obvious consequence of this. And maybe it's uh, best done by saying, hey, uh, let's take a look here maybe at a train. And the train's moving along. Oh, I, you know what? I, I know your, your author's got a, a, pit, a better picture. So save a little time here. Let me jump to your author's picture. Uh, he's got two of them, actually. I'll do this one. And instead of doing a train, he's going to do a spaceship here. And he says, okay, let's take a two observers. Uh, one person is in the spaceship moving along to the nearest star. And so we got this Alpha Centauri. And over here, we've got the observer at Earth seeing the spaceship go towards the star. 
And so I would say if I wanted to measure the speed of the spaceship, and by the way, notice I'm not talking about the speed of light now, right? The, the speed of light we just said is C for all observers. But if I wanted to know the speed of the spaceship, and I know the distance to the nearest star, and I call it L naught, and I measure a time of delta T, I might do something like this. V equals L over delta T. Now forget a minute that your author puts an L naught in there. I want to come back to that. But let's also do the same thinking for somebody who's in the spaceship. Remember we said that's the whole title of this, relativity. And so for somebody in the spaceship, they would say, oh, well, my speed, so I'll say V, would be the distance, and they would say L over delta T. Now, I know these look like the same equations, but remember we said already a couple things? The first one was early on, and I said, the first postulate says we can't really tell which one's moving. Uh, your author puts it this way, well, if you were on the earth, you would say the spaceship is moving away from you towards the nearest star. And you would say the spaceship is moving. But if you were in the spaceship, you might have a different perspective. You would say, oh, the star is coming towards me and the earth is going away from me. But I'm going to take that as an opportunity to say that since we can't tell which one is moving, we just know that they would be the same value. And so I'm going to take advantage of postulate number one. So I told you Einstein's brilliant. And of course, nobody doubts it when I say he's brilliant. But he's also bold because that whole time thing is just kind of hard to comprehend. And this was worse. Because then he says, well, now remember, the times aren't the same. Ooh. Do you see the logic here? If these times aren't the same, then the lengths can't be the same either. Wait, wait, wait. That's worth repeating. How big something is, how long is the space shuttle, depends then on how fast it is moving relative to your perspective. Wait, well, but who's right? <laughs> you see, it's a little bizarre. We're back to like time. You're telling me that the length of the Earth or the diameter of the Earth depends on the motion of somebody doing the observing? Mm -hmm. Just like the time is. That's the only way you can have the speed of light be the same for all observers. Uh, hey, that's Einstein's thinking. That's his brilliance. Uh, it's, it's logically sound as much as we don't like the end results at times, especially the first time you hear this, it's what we must accept. We can run some experiments to see if it's true, and we'll talk about those in a second. But let me just go ahead then and point out that maybe now it makes sense then why your author is putting an L naught in here. Because your author is trying to say we have the same dilemma with time dilation that we have with t length. We have to then pause and say the length is measured by whom? And since every person who's moving at a different speed will measure a different length, we need some kind of standard. And so we have what we call proper length. And like proper time, proper length is if there's no motion going on. And so you can see up here, if you are looking at from the Earth to the star, you would say, there is no motion between me. If, if I am on the Earth and I'm looking over at that star that's not moving, now I, I know stars are moving relative to each other slightly, but nothing compared to the speed of this, this spaceship. So I would say they don't move. There is no motion between me, the observer, who's on the Earth, and the two endpoints, which is the Earth and 
the star. So I'm going to come over here and call this one L naught. And that's what your author does. Your author says, from the Earth to the star is L naught. That would be the proper length. And that's why then down here in this picture, your author says, this person in the space shuttle, uh, spaceship would then be seeing the distance between the Earth and the star as moving. And so they would measure a length that would just be an L, which I'm going to call a non-proper length. And I'm going to put the same chart up here. Here's what we're going to do. There is a proper length. How much distance is it between our sun and the nearest star? And if you measure that with no motion, that's its proper length. But if you get in a spaceship and travel, you're going to measure a length that's slightly different. And if you're in a, somebody else is in another spaceship traveling at a different speed, they're going to measure yet a totally different non-proper length. And so there's a bunch of non-proper length, but there's only one standard proper length. And so knowing this, we want to look for, just like we did for time, is there a mathematical pattern that I could then calculate what the length is that you would see based on the length I know? And there is. And, and this is going to give it away here. And so that's why I'm going to put here an L with no naught in it and an L naught here. So proper length and non-proper. But of course now this discussion comes back to the time. Remember we already said these were different. That's why we are saying the lengths have to be different. And I probably should pause then and say, all right, if somebody is going to measure this time, which one measures the proper time? This can really get confusing. Let me go back to the definition of proper time. Proper time said there was no motion. So, let's say you are on the Earth watching the space shuttle, or spaceship. I keep saying space shuttle, but it's a spaceship. So, if you were standing here on the Earth watching it go to the nearest star, you would do something like this. You would say, okay, here's the spaceship. I'm going to close the doors. Start and you would turn on your stopwatch and the spaceship would be right in front of you. Many years later, or maybe just a few seconds if it's going really fast, it gets to the nearest star, you would hit stop. See how that would be a non-proper time? See how there was motion involved? And so, I'm going to say there is not N-O-T, a not, N-A-U-G-H-T, right? There's not a not here. The not is here. Let's think about the person in the spaceship. The person in the spaceship is sitting right here, and they go to measure time. They get out their stopwatch, and they go, okay, here is the Earth. The Earth is right up against my spaceship. Start. Then a few years later, or a few seconds if they go really fast, they're going to say, I'm right over the star. Stop. The starting and stopping are right over the person. It's the same spot. There is no motion to what they call the beginning and ending event. So this person is going to measure the proper time. And I know that can get confusing because you got, the way you measure length and the measure, way you measure time are a little bit different. That's why somebody who measures the proper length may not be the same person who measures proper time. And that's a little subtlety in here. Well, let's then use Einstein's thinking because we already have this relationship between a non-proper time and a proper time. And so we can replace this non-proper time with gamma multiplied by proper time. Oh, we can then notice that there would be a proper time 
in the denominator of both sides and I guess we could then calculate that off and then we can say we have what we're looking for what is the mathematical connection and that's worth saying it again now that we logically came up with the idea that the length of something is based upon our observation uh, based upon our observer and so we refer to this then as a length contraction I mean let's look at the math the math is saying here remember gamma is always greater than 1 that if you take its proper length anything that has a velocity would then have a number slightly greater than 1 or even a lot greater than 1 if it gets close to the speed of light and so the non-proper length is always smaller than the proper length and that's what your author is actually showing in this picture see the reason your author showed the distance between the earth and the nearest star as being something less than this picture is because of this mathematics because of the length contraction and so the person in the spaceship is saying Alpha Centaur is not that far away but the person on earth is saying well yes it is <laughs> because the person on earth is going to measure the proper length and the person on the spaceship is going to measure the non-proper length but now you'll see the math right the person in the spaceship gets a shorter distance but remember they're moving so their moving clock runs slow so they have a smaller distance and a smaller time whereas the person back on earth has a bigger distance and a bigger time and since velocity is the quotient of those two we now see that they can each measure the same speed and that's again I, every time I go through this I'm just amazed at Einstein's brilliance the, who, how the heck would you figure this out the first time he's just being very very logical and very very bold and saying look we know they have to come out with the same speed whether you observe the spaceship is moving away from you or you move the Alpha Centaur coming towards you you got to come up with the same one and since the times are different the lengths have to be different and it's just an exercise in intellectual brilliancy and so this is now our length contraction notice also what your author did in this picture did you notice that he deliberately made the earth kind of oblong because the viewpoint of somebody moving would say length is contracted in the motion or in the direction they're moving and so the earth would look not like a sphere anymore but it would be contracted along the line of motion but not vertically and so the viewpoint from this observer back here so the one in the spaceship moving would look back and see the earth as an oblong because the diameter has shrunk length contraction and that's why your author has put both Alpha Centaur and the earth as an oval and the length shorter together and then trying to convince you that you take the ratio of their distance and their time you're going to get the, the same number and I really wish I could kind of show this to you this you know I like to do demonstrations but I just have no way here in the lab to show you something moving fast to the speed of light in fact a few years back I asked Ron I said well you know Ron this is going to be hard to get how how do we show the students this and he said well it's easy you you start with a meter stick and you say it's one meter long let's make it go really fast and now it's this size all right well actually it's just a broke meter stick so I can't really show you the length contraction but it does make a silly little toy as saying all right if you and I are stationary you see this I start moving really fast you see this and that's our silly length contraction well I told you these were a little bizarre and I don't know how well they're sitting in with you but I told you I'd give you three really bizarre ones here at the beginning you ready for the worst one all right so if you're happy with those or even if you're unhappy 
well, let's move on because this one is conceptually bizarre and fortunately that's all the further your author goes uh, as you'll see here we won't have any math the math uh, I guess uh, he concludes it's a little beyond the scope of this class um, it is some tough algebra but it, I don't know if it's really beyond the scope of this class but I'm kind of glad he, he doesn't give us the equation so we don't have to really talk about it other than conceptually here but I'm going to put a fancy word up here and just say well what about two events that happened at the same moment Uh, maybe the events were see something like this maybe maybe on this end of the table I'll put a little flashing green light and on this end of the table I'll put a little flashing red light and let's say I adjust them so from your perspective you see the light at the same time and, and you go all right well the light got to me at the same time now I, I I would say it took a while for the light to get there so by the time the light gets to me I wouldn't say they were were flashing at that instant but because the red and the green one got there at exactly the same time I would say they were flashing at the same moment they were simultaneous okay I, I got a little video here of Einstein's thinking because it is just a little tough to digest and so here's a little video uh, this right here is supposed to be these little flashes of light and for simplicity we'll put the detector right in the middle and so I'll say that you know that that's you and maybe I better hit pause before we get too far okay and so notice that these lights flash and this is you you're, you're observing them and did you see that the light traveled out and got to you at the same instant so again you're pretty smart you would know that they didn't flash when the light got to you you would know that they flashed a little earlier than that but you would also know that because light travels the same speed that they must end at the, the same distance away from you that they must have each flashed a little earlier but the same amount of time a little earlier let me just call it a microsecond so if I have this flash of light from left and right or I should say you left and right and it gets to you you're gonna say okay it, it, it got to me okay but what that meant is a microsecond earlier that light was flashing and a microsecond earlier that one was flashing ah so those each flashed at the same moment they were simultaneous they actually flashed at the same time okay but now here's where it gets a little tough let's say there's somebody in a spaceship going by watching the same event that'll be me so again you watched it you said oh they happened at the same moment in time I'm gonna come by in my spaceship and I stopped it just before I get into the picture but it, it's right about here there's this big long spaceship let me click play here for the big long spaceship and I'll even hit pause all right so this spaceship has another data recorder that's so this is gonna be me and I'm going to record when the flashes get to me and then think about this process so I come along here and then right when they match up I'll stop it just shy so when you and I get in exactly the same place remember that's exactly halfway between the two so we're both same place halfway between the two they will flash at the same moment as seen by who okay here we go and so I let it go flash now 
did you see that? Uh, maybe it's worth coming back, what was I? And watching it all the way through. The two observers at the same time flash right now. But did you notice that the flash of light actually came to me a little bit sooner? I got this light sooner than that light. Now, if you're still thinking what I'll call old school, you go, well, I don't see a problem with that. I mean, they flash. And so maybe I'll kind of walk across the stage. You go, okay, well, I come along and it hits right here and I'm exactly in the middle and it flashes. But since I'm moving this way and the light is coming towards me, it's not a surprise then that I get this one flashed first because this one I'm moving away from, right? The, the light's got to kind of catch up to me. But see, there's something really wrong with that thinking. What's wrong with that thinking is you are saying the speed of light was different for me, the observer. Right? You're saying as I am moving into it, it's as if the light is coming faster towards me. And that light, as I'm moving away, you're saying it is going slower. It, it would be the same thing that you might say if I was in a car going this way and something on a, let's say a fast motorcycle was, was catching me, you would say the rate at which it catches me would vary depending on how fast I'm going this way. And what I'm trying to say is in Einstein's brilliance, he said, oh no, 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 that <clears throat> if this doesn't bother you, then you don't get it. You're still thinking that the light can travel at different speeds from the different observers. You need to remember that the light has to travel, the postulate here, based on experiment, <coughs> excuse me, says that the light has to travel the same speed. So for a moving observer, me being the moving observer, I get here, if the light traveled at the same speed, and if I'm right in the middle, I should get them at the same moment. That didn't happen. What happened is I got a flash of light from this one first, and then later from that one. And so the third bizarre consequence is Einstein says, well, that's easy to explain. It's not that this speed was faster because you were moving towards the light and the speed of this light was slower because you were moving away. The whole reason you didn't get the flash of light at the same moment is because that one over there flashed first and that one flashed second. So from my perspective, I would say they were not at the same time. I would say this one flashed first. That's why I got the light and then that one flashed. But you're saying, no, I got the light at the same time. They happened at the same time. And Einstein's saying, that's fine. You're just a different observer. It's not that you're right and I'm wrong. Neither of us is right, neither of us is wrong. But what we call simultaneity is gone. Two events for one observer, you, that happened at the same moment, happened one first and then the other. Whoa. I must say, we finally hit bizarre number three. I'll call it the grand finale bizarre number three, but we now we've got consequences of these bizarre consequences, and we've got a lot to talk about still in this, in this chapter here. But I just wanted to say that we have three big things. We have time dilation, we have length contraction, and we have the loss of simultaneity. All of those, just because we're going to start off and say the speed of light is the same for all observers. Wow. Th that deserves a pause. Okay, but I'll keep going because it gets what I call 
the consequence of these consequences. And so you can imagine that everything in our physical world that we have been doing up until Einstein has been related up on distance and time. And if distance and times are relative, everything else is. Velocities, accelerations, momentums, energy, power. I mean, the list goes on. And we just have to kind of redo all of our thinking. Fortunately, we only have to do a rethink if we get close to the speed of light. Remember that gamma factor? So, the way I like to teach it in my science class is I say, all right, if you're going to go into engineering and you're going to build cars and boats and planes and things in motion, you really don't need to worry about these additional complexities. You can build the world as we've been doing our mechanics. However, if you really want to understand the science of it, or if you're going to build anything that either goes very fast or very accurate in time, you need to consider these more complications to the world. And the GPS is a good example of that. The, in order for my GPS system to work, I got to measure time extremely accurate. And so the satellites go somewhat fast, but not really that fast compared to the speed of light. But their timing is so critical that you got to include the time dilation in the, in the factors. Uh, if you're building one of these giant atom smashers, like in Geneva here, you, you got to engineer it with the idea that these things are going close to the speed of light. And then take into a factor, this extra factor called gamma. And so for you guys being life scientists, I hope this is more of a, a science curiosity to you. I don't think it'll come into play in your world of the physical or the, of the life sciences, uh, but hopefully it'll stimulate your curiosity into the physical science that, wow, the world we live in is really weird, really complex. It, and of course, we're going to see the same thing when we get to small stuff. All right, well, here's what your author attacks next. He looks at relative velocities. And that kind of makes sense to be the next step because remember, we started this whole discussion, and I'll come back to it, by saying this. He said, again, if you were in a spaceship and you're moving along and you take a laser beam and you fire it, I should see it moving away at the speed of light. You too should see it moving away at the speed of light. But if you do your old school thinking, you would say, oh, it would be the speed of light because you fired the laser, but the laser was in the spaceship going half the speed of light, so the speed should be one and a half times the speed of light. It doesn't work that way. And so Einstein is saying that maybe now that we understand this whole time dilation and length contraction, maybe now we can dive deeper into why it doesn't come out to be a greater speed. And what does it come out to be? So, your author's got a couple of pictures here, uh, and really good pictures. They've got a lot of symbols in them, and so I hope you can kind of follow the symbols. I'll start with something simple. Uh, your author does this. He says, in old school thinking, so let me get my marker here. He says, if you have one observer, and so this girl, and it looks like somebody pulling the girl, will be one set of an observer. And this boy over here will be the other observer. Let's watch something moving, which in this happens to be the snowball. Okay? And so here's where it gets confusing because there's a lot of speeds going on. Do you see three speeds here? Let's talk about them. The first speed is how fast is observer one closing in on observer two? Or the other way around, because remember we said these are all relatives. How fast is observer two closing in on one? And that's called V. 
And that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about two different observers observing something and their speed is V between them. Okay, so nothing new there. But because these observers are watching a snowball fly, they're going to be saying, well, what's the speed of that snowball? And they're each going to have a number there, and so that's the other two speeds. So, do you see the three speeds? The first one is, what is the speed between the two observers? That's the V. But the other one is, what is the speed of the snowball as seen by the first observer? And what is the speed of the snowball as seen by the second observer? And here's where it can get confusing. I just want to point it out. Your author uses the symbol U for that. And so this person here has a U saying, this is the speed of the snowball. But the girl throwing the snowball has a speed, what we're going to call U prime. So again, the U is the speed of the object we're observing. In this case, it's a snowball. But the V is the speed between those two. And so if you're doing old school thinking, you would say something like this. You would say that from the girl's perspective, she's going to throw it from the sled at a speed of 1.5. But the sled is moving one meter per second towards the observer of the boy. And so you might come over here and go mathematically, that would be the speed u. So the speed is seen by the boy, would be the speed thrown by the girl, plus how fast is the girl moving towards the boy? Right? This is the old school thing. And this this is where we started. This is where I said if you had a laser beam and the laser beam was in a spaceship going half the speed of light and then you fired it and so it would go at the speed of light away from me you, somebody on the outside would just add the two together somebody would say hey from the person in the spaceship it's going the speed of light plus half the speed of light because the spaceship is moving so somebody on the outside would see it as 1.5 times the speed of light. Now, you can see by this whole discussion that doesn't work. And so Einstein is trying to say then, what's wrong with this? How are we going to figure out what the speed of the snowball is by the two observers? So he goes through a bunch more math. Now, we've already done some pretty significant math. This math gets even tougher and so I will pass on doing the math and just give you the formula and that's how your author approaches it uh, I can't uh, it's kind of small here I'll put it on the board here but he says then if you wanted to know the speed u it would be equal to u prime plus v over ah and so this is how the math works out this is that extra gamma factor that shows up and then we've got this one plus u prime v prime over the speed of light squared so without proof this is your author's equation that he says, if you ever want to know the speed of something, this is how you combine, combine them together. This would then be a way of incorporating length contraction and time dilation. Wow. Okay. Okay. Notice over here that if either one of these speeds is slow compared to the speed of light, this is so small we can neglect it. And now we're back to what is often called the equivalence principle, that it's back to our old school thinking. 
And so as long as we're going slow compared to the speed of light, we get to the stuff we're used to. And so Einstein is the one who is, like I said, brilliant enough and bold enough to say, oh, that's how the world is at these high speeds. And it just seems weird to us. Watch this for a moment. This is always a fun calculation here. Let me put this into consideration. Let me go ahead and say, I'm in this spaceship going half the speed of light that way. And I'm going to take my laser beam and I'm going to fire it at the speed of light. Speed of light relative to me. And I'm going to ask this question, what speed do you observe? Now, I hope you're saying the speed of light. That was the postulate here. But if everything we've done is self-consistent, we should be able to put it in that formula. And now you'll understand how Einstein gets that formula. What, that formula should be based upon time dilation and length contraction in such a complex way that any other observer would observe this laser beam to go the speed of light. So let me give it a try. Let me come over here. And of course, the other thing I want you to see is this kind of will help you with the symbolism. This is the speed of the object, so this would be the laser beam, as seen by the observer in the moving spaceship. Okay, so I fire the laser beam and I say I'm going with a speed C. I'm sorry, the laser beam goes away from me at C. I'm traveling at a speed V. Now, I know I said half the speed of light, but if I would have said three quarters the speed of light, shouldn't you also observe it at the speed of light? I mean, isn't that the fundamental idea? That no matter how fast I'm going in this spaceship, when I shoot my laser at the speed of light, you will observe it also at the speed of light. And so let me not put in half the speed of light. Let me not put in three quarters. Let me just leave it as V, any speed. Any speed that I am moving, in my spaceship, when I fire this laser beam, not only will I see at the speed of light, but so will you. So let's give the math a try here. I'm claiming that if I'm traveling at any speed V and I shoot a laser beam so the light goes away from me at C, this calculation should give me C. So let's see if we get C. All right, so I'll put a one plus. And then again, this would be a C over a V over a C squared. Uh, if I maybe cancel off one of the C's here, I would get a C plus a V over a one plus V over C. Uh, I guess if you let me multiply top and bottom by a C. Um, I'll have a C plus a V multiplied by C on the top. Let me just kind of leave those separate. But I'll do the distributive property on the bottom, and so this would be a C plus a V on the bottom, which would cancel with here, and sure enough, this beautiful formula says that another observer would see it as C no matter how fast the person in the, space shuttle, the spaceship is going. Big speed, small speed. Now maybe one that's a little more interesting is what your author does next here. Your author says, okay, let's look maybe at two different objects, neither one of them going the speed of light. I won't take the time to do both. Maybe I'll just look at, at this one here. But this one is saying, so I'm in my spaceship going half the speed of light. And I then throw or shoot something out of my spaceship. So away from me, it's going three quarters of the speed of light. Now again, with old school thinking, I would have done this. Old school thinking, I would have said, I'm going half the speed of light. 
I then throw something away from me at three quarters of the speed of light, the observer out there says, oh, that would be a half plus three quarters. Uh, what does that come out to be? Five quarters, so 1.25 times the speed of light. They would say it goes faster than the speed of light. And I'm going to say, no, not even close. As we will soon prove in this math, I don't care what the speed is, you will never get it to speed of light. I can go 99% the speed of light and throw something at 99% the speed of light. The end result of those two will not be greater than the speed of light. Even that thing that left me at 99% of the speed of light could throw something else at 99% of the speed of light. And that could throw something at 99% of the speed of light. And if you add up all those speeds, you still will get something less than the speed of light if you do this formula. You will never get to the speed of light. We'll see that in terms of energy real soon here. But let me try some numbers here. Again, just because I think this could be a tough calculation here. So I'll do the numbers here. The U prime is three quarters of the speed of light. The speed of the other observer, the spaceship, is half the speed of light. I will use this as an opportunity to point out why these calculations can be kind of hard. So we like to label everything in terms of a percentage of the speed of light. Because you can see then right here, we get something really nice. In the top, we get 1.25c. That's what we would have gotten with old school thinking. But then we would divide it by 1 plus. And We'll have to go 0.75 times 0.5, and this would be 0.375. And this denominator will always come out bigger than this prefactor. So 1.25 divided by 1.375, and I'm about 91% the speed of light. And so you would observe it at about 91 the speed of light. Certainly faster than I observe it, because I am throwing it away from me, and it's going forward, and that hopefully doesn't surprise you that you would observe it faster than I do. But it's not faster than the speed of light. That will never happen, despite what you might see in Hollywood. It just doesn't happen. Now, let's look at another bizarre consequence. Or maybe I shouldn't say bizarre consequence, but another piece of all of this. And you can kind of see this idea forming. Uh, again, if I take this laser beam and I shoot it that way, I would say it goes away from me at the speed of light. And if somebody was coming at me, uh, they would say, hey, it's still coming at me at the speed of light. But they would see something a little different. And this goes back to when we did our acoustics. We called it a Doppler effect. We would say the frequency changed. And because that person is moving into the crest of the waves at a faster rate, they are going to pick up a higher frequency. And so your author lists that. Uh, doesn't prove it. I think I skipped over it. Let me come back. Where did he kind of shine the, the headlights here? Uh, uh, maybe that's not quite where he did it. Those were headlights. But somewhere in here, ah, Doppler shift, he says that there is going to be, and we've got this nice little formula here, that says what will be this new frequency. And for that matter, we can write it as a new wavelength. And so I'm going to do the frequency and say, OK, what is the frequency that the observer picks up? Well, let's say the frequency is coming from, in, the case my, in my case, the laser. So I will call that the proper frequency. So when I hold it in my hand, there's no motion. 
and the little oscillator here that makes the light and I don't know what this frequency is, but given that it's green light, it's a couple hundred terahertz. So the frequency is a couple of hundred terahertz. But an observer then will observe a slightly different frequency depending on how fast that observer is moving compared to the speed of light. And by the way, will you notice that this equation for the Doppler effect is a little different than the equation for the Doppler effect we did in our acoustics? And the reason why is we weren't going close to the speed of light. We didn't even know there was a gamma factor. We didn't include time dilation and length contractions. Uh, I suppose you might argue our, it wasn't complete. But again, because we were so slow compared to the speed of light, the equation we got for the Doppler effect with acoustics is very reasonable, but it is different than this one. And this one, we have to take in consideration time dilation and length contraction. We, we have no choice because we are going close to the speed of light. We would get the wrong answer. Where in the acoustic ones, we're just off by the 12th decimal place and it's like, ah, oh, we're going so slow, we can just say gamma is approximately equal to one. And so that's that corresponding principle here. Well, again, I did not prove this to you and I won't bother to prove it to you and I'll wait to do some examples with them, but I should just wanted to point out that there would be a change. Well, a couple more things and we'll be done with the, the chapter here and we'll take our break, but let's go ahead and say, well, what other consequences are there. And another one would then be the momentum. Uh, probably not a surprise because momentum is having to do with velocities and velocity has to do with time and all these things need to be rethought about because of time dilation. And so before we got to this chapter, way back in chapter Oh, that was way back in Physics 110 before we started this 111. And that was also, I think, I don't, know, I don't even remember what number it was. Uh, I think it was 8, Conservation of Momentum. We just said it was MV. But if you run through a little evaluation of it, because of the extra factor of time dilation in the velocity, a more appropriate equation for momentum is gamma times mv. And again, you'll see what we did way back in physics 110 is we just said gamma was equal to 1, which was true if we weren't going close to the speed of light, and that's our co correspondence principle. It, they do correspond at low speeds. And so Einstein is just giving us more science, better science. Uh, I suppose it more complicated, but again, we don't get to pick and choose how nature behaves. We just have to run the experiment and know if our understanding makes us feel uneasy, it's because we don't understand it. The, the experiments are right, it's just we don't understand it. We call that empirical science. It's the big difference between modern science and the ancient Greeks. Uh, we don't just reason something out, we, it's got to be backed up with the experiment. And if the reason doesn't match the experiments, we go with the side of the experiment. Of course, you've got to be careful because an experiment is humans taking data and they could be wrong too. So it's, you know, it's, it's tough there. But that's the philosophy behind modern uh, science. So let me keep going on here because then Einstein goes on to talk about the energy. And sadly, we just need to move on to other things here. But he shows that the total energy comes out to be gamma times mc squared. And I say too bad about this one because this is very, very interesting and something very revolutionary for Einstein and for the world at that time because what if v is equal to zero? See, if I was just in old school thinking, I would say my kinetic energy is one half mv squared, right? And I would say if I'm not moving, I have no kinetic energy. 
But Einstein realizes something quite fascinating. And it's interesting that I think most people know this equation. They're just not real sure where it came from or what it means. But if your velocity is zero, gamma comes out to be one. And so the energy, what we call a rest energy, is equal to mc squared. m being your mass, c being the speed of light. And this is a revolution in thought because this is Einstein saying, oh my gosh, mass is a form of energy. And up until this point in your education, you probably heard the phrase in a chemistry class, oh, conservation of mass. And separate from that, you've probably heard conservation of energy. And Einstein's saying, whoa, whoa, mass is a form of energy. The, these are the same statements. We need to change that to the principle of conservation of energy and think of mass as being an energy. Which then opens a whole new world is, could we then convert, sort of like we convert solar energy into electrical energy, could we have the technology to take the mass of, say, uranium and convert it into, say, thermal energy, boil water, turn a turbine, and make electricity? And this is the foundation of nuclear energy. That mass is a form of energy. And it's enormous. I mean, take a look at this number. Even if the mass is small, the speed of light, and the speed of light squared, is huge. So it doesn't take much mass to be part of an enormous amount of energy. In fact, a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier uses about a softball size of fuel. And they just shove that thing into the reactor and said, Here's your fuel for the next 50 years. It's enormous amount. Now, I say that with a little jest because there's so much other equipment needed in order to extract the energy and work the energy that we've got all these compartments and all these other uh, rods and other radioactive stuff. And so the whole engineering is very, very complex and much bigger, but smaller than what it would take if you were to run that uh, aircraft carrier with diesel fuel and a old-fashioned internal combustion engine. And so that's the neat thing about nuclear energy is it's an enormous amount of energy. If we can just kind of learn to harness it in a way that is not so complex or in a way that doesn't make other radioactive problems, we would be golden. And so that, of course, is that hopeful dream of nuclear fusion, and more on that in later chapters. But it is the conversion of mass into energy. So when we talk about total energy, we probably then should say mc squared is how much energy an object has just because it has mass, and then, of course, kinetic energy because this leads to an equation that does not equal one-half mv squared, and it gives us a chance to see a new equation. What should be the best formula for kinetic energy? And if you take this and move this to the other side, you will see that there is an mc squared in each of them and so Einstein gives us a new, better, more complete equation for kinetic energy. Well, one more thing, and it's time for a break. It's way past time for a break. But one more thing here that Einstein does is he says, let's maybe put these equations together. And saving some math. I'm going to say that the total energy squared is equal to the momentum times c squared plus 
m c squared squared. And again, another an absolutely amazing discovery here is not so much all of these equations, but a consequence we're going to see as we continue on in these next couple of chapters of modern physics. Look what this equation is saying. When you think about particles, most people think of particles and they say, oh yeah, I got a little tiny particle. It's got mass and as it moves along, of course, it has energy and momentum. What if it had no mass? Well, if you're thinking old school, you'd go, well, no mass uh, would mean no momentum. And of course, again, if you're thinking old school, you would think, well, no mass, no energy. So particles have mass in order to have momentum and energy, right? However, with this new thinking, and this is why I wanted to kind of get to this equation, is it possible to have something, I'll call it a particle, with no mass. See, if I put a zero here, it's still possible to say that that zero mass particle has momentum and energy. And this opens a door to what we're going to call photons and gluons. Particles that in Einstein's time weren't known about at this point but they open the door to a possibility that we can talk about particles, things that have momentum and energy, yet they have no mass. And you need to see that. Otherwise, our next step when we talk about photons and we talk about gluons, you're like, well, why do you call them particles? They have no mass. And I, I call them particles because they have momentum and they have energy, yet they have no mass. And of course, that would only be true with time dilation. And so the other thing we will see, coming back over to here, and maybe working on your calculus a little bit, how in the world are you going to get momentum if mass is zero? Only if this goes to infinity, right? Remember those limit problems where one factor would go to infinity and the other would go to zero? And you had to figure out the limit? And this only goes to infinity at the speed of light. So the other thing here is we can actually have a number here, even though that number is zero, if you're going the speed of light. So these things called photons and these things called gluons and any particle then that has no mass must also go the speed of light. Must always go the speed of light. Every observer must observe it as going the speed of light. And now we're full circle. This is Einstein's brilliance and excitement. He's like, oh my gosh, this is why Every observer has to see these particles going at the speed of light. That's the only way that they can have momentum and energy. That's the way only nature would be self-consistent. Uh, nature would collapse on itself. We wouldn't have atoms that were forming. We wouldn't have galaxies that were forming. Nature has to be this way. You can have particles of zero mass if they go at uh, the speed of light because gamma becomes infinite. Well, I was talking a long time, and I hope you guys online took a break somewhere in, in all of this. But when we come back for the break, I want to just kind of go to the chapter and do some calculations, pull out these, because these can be some tough c calculations, because they will bother you conceptually. Fortunately, the calculations won't be so hard, but because they will bother you conceptually, they, they can be hard to do. And so let's take our break and then we'll, we'll come back. I'll see you in a little bit. Hey, okay, welcome back here, everybody. We uh, took our little break here and let's do a comment on some of these calculations. Uh, you can see that the concepts are pretty advanced, but fortunately, if you kind of know enough about the concepts, you know where to put the numbers in the equation here. And that's what I want to show you. So I'm going to start here with number two. Uh, number two is really about this gamma factor and as I was saying here 
it's the gamma factor that keeps playing this role in the sense of how close are we to the speed of light? When do we need to consider it? And this first one says, number two, just says, what is the gamma factor when you go 10% the speed of light and then 90% the speed of light? All right, so let me start with 10%. Um, it would look something like this, 1 over 1 minus, and I'll put a square root. And again, now you can see why it's really nice to write the speed in terms of a percentage of the speed of light. Because if I put 0.1c over c, and then think of the whole thing squared, and so I'll just take the whole thing squared, then this comes out. And now you just have 1 over the square root of 1 minus, and then it would be 0.1 squared. So a tenth squared is 100th. And so you can see that uh, this gamma factor then is going to be very, very close to 1. Uh, let's see what I get. Uh, 1 minus 100th. Uh, uh, then I'll take the uh, square root of that. Uh, then I'll take the reciprocal of that. And it is 1.005 zero and I'll stop there but that's what I was saying earlier that unless we go 10% the speed of light and maybe I should even mention so 10% the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the seventh meters per second the gamma factor barely changes and it's only what, a half a percent higher at 10% the speed of light so that's why I was saying look for most things, we're not going even 10% the speed of light. Our kind of our general rule is 10% the speed of light, less than that. Don't worry about gamma. Do the old school thinking and think like Newton and Galileo and everything's fine. We don't need the Einstein stuff. The other factor is 90% the speed of light. So here, gamma would be 1 over the square root of 1 minus and I'll put 0.9c over c squared to again indicate that it's really nice to write the speeds with all these equations in terms of the percentage of the, of the speed of light. So this becomes 1 over, and I guess I'll have the square root of 1 minus, and 0.9 squared, so 9 squared is 81, and then two decimal places. And so this will have a significant number. And even then, I'd put it on the small side. It's not like it's a 10 or a 20 or a 30. Uh, let's see what it is. 1 minus uh, 0.10 uh, square root of all of that, and then the reciprocal. So this is about a 2.3. So very significant in the sense that if we're talking about time dilation, and we'll go back to that twin paradox, if, if my twin left and I, uh, well, I'll take the twin. The twin aged one year. I would age 2.3 years. So I would be older than my twin. But not as extreme as we saw in that uh, little picture when we were doing it. I mean, you, you got to get really close to the speed of light. Even 90% of speed of light is incredibly large speed. And we're, we're still talking about something very significant. I mean, 2.3, you know, that would be like twins at birth they were separated and they came back, you know, if one is 10 years old, the other is 23 years old. And, you know, it's, it's a noticeable difference, but it's not an overwhelming difference. It's not like time stood still for, for one of them. It just moved along slower. Well, the next one on my list kind of fits into this category. Let's try number four. Uh, this goes from just kind of looking at the gamma factor to using the gamma factor and its time dilation. Uh, I'll read it over here. It says, suppose that a particle called a kaon is created by this cosmic radiation striking the upper atmosphere. It moves by you at 98% the speed of light. And it lives for 1.24 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds when at rest relative to the observer. Now, let me pause and put the equation for time dilation up here. Non-proper time equals to gamma times proper time. And I could just plug in the numbers, but I have noticed that where students struggle, and rightfully so, 
is reading the problem and knowing which time they're talking about because we have proper time and non-proper time. In fact, we have many non-proper times and only one proper time. And just like lengths, we got a proper length and many non-proper lengths. Which one goes into the description of the problem can be a little, little challenging here. So remember, our definition of proper was no motion relative to whatever it is we're measuring. And if we're measuring time, that means there would be some kind of event, which this is the life of these tiny particles. So in other words, if the particle is right in front of me and I start my watch, and then it uh, dies right in front of me and I stop my watch, then that is the proper time, because there was no motion. But if it was moving relative to me and I go, okay, it lived, it started here, birth, death. All right. So start and stop would be at two different locations. That would be a non-proper time. So you got to read it kind of carefully. And so this is what it says here. It says it lives for this time when it is at rest relative to observer. All right. So at rest relative to observer means you're talking about the proper time and that would be right here. And so well, I better read the question now. So now I know which time they're, they're, they're talking about here. And so then it goes on to say, how long does it live? Uh, how long does it live as you observe? So as it goes whoosh, racing by you. So you're going to measure a non-proper time. So let me put in the gamma factor. That would be 1 over the square root of 1 minus and now that you've seen me do two calculations with the gamma factor, will it be okay if I just skip the step where I cross out the, the C's? And I'm just going to put 0 0.98 squared. And what was the proper time on this one? 1.24 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds. And in fact, this one is not so bad to just go ahead and actually, out of curiosity, this is going pretty fast. Remember, we already did at 90% the speed of light was 2.3. And so now we're getting kind of close to this. This could be a significant uh, factor here. So 1 minus 0.98 squared, taking the square root of all of that, and then taking the reciprocal. This is 5.03. And then multiply by the time of 1.24 times 10 to the negative 8 would give me 6.23 times 10 to the 8th seconds. So five times longer. Mm -hmm. And so that's that gamma factor. All right. And that's, like I said, important piece. All right. Well, let me go down here to a, a, a length contraction one. I got number 12 on my list I thought would be educational here. So let's give that one a try. I think it's on the top of the page. Uh, no, it must be the bottom of this column. And so number 12 just simply says this. It says a spaceship is 200 meters long as seen on board. And if I wanted just to say the same thing, that when you go to do any of these problems, and particularly ones involving length and time, you've got to not just know what the formula is, but what do we mean by proper length and proper time? Because they, or and non-proper length and non-proper time, because they're going to give you a description and you, really, you need to know which one they are giving you. And that can be a challenge here. So when somebody comes along here and says the spaceship is 200 meters as seen by somebody on board, that means you're in the spaceship, right? And like me in this room, I can look at that wall and then head over to that wall. And I am measuring the distance between those two walls. And since I'm in the room or in the spaceship, even if we're moving, there's no, and I, sorry, even if we're moving relative to you on the outside, 
what I see is no motion of those walls. Those walls are not coming towards me or going away from me. And so you may think we're moving, that, that's fine, and that's why you would measure a non-proper length for the spaceship. But somebody on board is going to measure the proper length. So this is their way of saying, we're telling you the proper length. So then they can go and say, it's moving relative to the Earth at 97% the speed of light. What is the length as measured by somebody on the Earth? Okay, so a non-proper length. So then I can just put in my 200 and divide it by 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.97 squared. And I guess we have a couple of options. Uh, we could actually, since this is a compound fraction, flip and multiply. Or we can just figure out this by itself and get the gamma factor and say the 200 is reduced by that gamma factor. And, and that's what I like. So I'm going to take that approach. Although, like I said, this might be nice to just simplify to a compound fraction, but I'm going to do this whole compound fraction. So I'm going to go 1 minus 0.97 squared and hit enter, and then I'm going to take its square root, and then I'm going to take its reciprocal. So this gamma factor down here is about a 4, which makes sense because we're a little bit less than the speed we had on this one, which we got a gamma factor of 5, and the gamma factor just keeps getting bigger. And of course, 4 is bigger than the 2.3 we got back here in problem 2 where we were going 90% the speed of light. So I'd expect it to be between this 2.3 and this 5.03, which is why I got 4.11. So then if I take the 200 and divide by that gamma factor, this would say somebody looking at this spaceship from the Earth, as it goes flying by pretty fast, would say the length of this spaceship is 48.6 meters. And so that's our length contraction. Remember, moving clocks or running clocks run slow. Moving objects shrink. So that's why we have that phrase length contraction and time dilation. It's where that gamma factor is, whether it's in the numerator or in the denominator. All right, well, let's try another one here. Uh, this one I decided to go ahead and do because these kind of go quickly here. Uh, I did one like this uh, before the, the break, talking about the speed of something. But this has a part C if it's kind of shot the other way. In fact, these were exactly the numbers I, I did. So I was like, well, should I do this one ag again? And I think it couldn't hurt to see the symbols again. But I think it would be very enlightening to see B. So I was going, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and, and do this. It'll be worth the, the extra time here. So number 20 is adding velocities together. And I think the hardest part of adding velocities together is keeping track of what is meant in these symbols. So let me just summarize. There'll be two observers, and they're moving relative to each other. Okay, So that's where the V is. The V is the velocity of the two observers. They're each looking at some object and that object has a velocity, so that's what we call u. But each observer would have a different view of its velocity, so there's a u and a u prime. Uh, so we like to say that u prime is the person who's moving and then looking so moving at V away from this, and then looking at that moving object, they would get a U prime. But without the prime, this would be the speed that the non-moving observer would have. Of course, remember, all speeds are relative, so we really can't say who's moving and who's not. So that's you know, not a, the best way, perhaps, to say it. But you can do it in terms of pencil and paper and say, make 
the person who's not moving the U. Okay, so coming over to here, it says here, Suppose that a spaceship is heading towards the Earth at 0.75c uh, can shoot a canister at 0.5c relative to the ship. What is the velocity of the canister relative to the Earth if it is shot directly at the Earth and if it is shot directly away from the Earth. All right, so let's go back here and make sure we got this part right. The spaceship is heading towards the Earth. So in my picture here, I'm going to say, all right, here's the Earth. Here is the spaceship. The spaceship is heading towards the Earth. Uh, the ultimate question, let me just confirm this, is what's the speed of this canister as seen by somebody on Earth? And uh, so what is the velocity of the canister relative to the Earth? So let me call Earth the unprimed. This is what I want to find right here, the U. I want to find out how fast is it going as seen by this person. Okay, so what do I need? I need the U prime and the V. Let me start with the V. Because the V is the velocity then of the other observer as they are heading towards me. So the other observer is the spaceship. So this would be the velocity of the spaceship. And so it says towards the Earth at 0.75. And I'm going to call that a plus 0.75 because of course I have it set up moving to the right. Just got me thinking that somebody could have drawn this picture heading to the left and all right, everything would be the same with a bunch of negatives in it because everything would be going left and, instead of positive. But that's the V. Now the U prime is how fast is this canister moving as seen by the person in the moving piece which is the spaceship. And so they say the canister is shot at half the speed of light relative to the ship. So that would be the U prime. So I'll come over here and put 0.5C. But I want to point out in this problem, it could be a plus or a minus depending on which way we shoot it. See, in A, I believe they said we shoot it towards the Earth. A, what is the velocity of the canister relative to the Earth if it is shot directly at the Earth? So in my picture, it is shot to the right, being another positive. So I'm going to put a positive there. And then I can go one plus. And again, if you'll let me do a little simplification in my head and point out, this is kind of the nice thing about writing velocities in terms of the fraction of the speed of light. Because if each of these are written with a C in them, they would cancel off and I just have the Prefactor. I just have the ratio of how fast they are going relative to the speed of, of light. Okay, so when I add these together, like I did last time, 1.25c, and I believe this was a 375 is what we got before the break. Let me just kind of grab my calculator because this all is exactly the same that, that we did. Um, uh, 0.5 times 0.75. Well, yeah, half of 75 is 375. Yeah, obviously. Okay, so then we get the 1.25 divided by 1.375. And oh, yeah, and we got 91% C. All right, so remember all those numbers. All right, so that is the speed that, say, I'm on Earth would see it coming to me. You in the spaceship would see it leaving you at half the speed of light. And even though I would also see you coming at me at three quarters of the speed of light, it's not just simply add the two together. That's what I want to emphasize. But I thought I'd go ahead and also continue on and do this one because how would I approach this problem in B where they say we're going to shoot the canister opposite the direction of the Earth. Um, it says if it is shot directly away from the Earth. And I'll change my picture, or maybe I'll, I'll switch over to 
blue color and say it's shot that way. Okay, so if I shoot it that direction, that is the U prime, right? What is the speed as it leaves the spaceship? So now I'm going to put a negative 0.5 C. Of course, the spaceship is still headed towards me, that is to the right, so I'm going to say the spaceship is still a plus 0.75. And then downstairs, I'm going to get a 1 plus, and then I will put in a negative 0.5, and then a positive 0.75. And of course, the numerator is the easy one to do, both mathematically and conceptually. See, the numerator would be the old school thinking, right? You're, you're moving along at three quarters the speed of light and you throw something back at half the speed of light. You would think this person over here would be, well, three quarters minus a half quarter of the speed of light. It's still going that way because you didn't throw it back as fast as you were going this way. And like I said, that's what you would have got in the old way of thinking. But now I have a 1, and notice it's a minus, and again it's half of 75, so half of 75 is 37 and a half. And so I would get a speed of, and I'll do the bottom first, 1 minus 0.375. And so I'll go 0.25 divided by that last answer. And so this would come out to be 40% the speed of light. And I, I'd say it again, it's not quite as simple as you might have thought. You, you would think, in simple reason, if you didn't know that there was time dilation or length contraction and that factor of gamma, you would get it wrong because it comes into play. And that's what this whole denominator comes into play for. So 0.4 is not the same as 0.25. All right, well, let me uh, move on to another one. Uh, this is a, uh, a uh, frequency shifting one, a number uh, 25 here. And uh, I'll just take this as an opportunity to say that we had this little formula. Uh, didn't really work it out for you, but did say that an observer who's moving would take the, what I'll call the proper frequency, the, the frequency you would get if there was no motion, and then times the square roots of 1 over 1 minus your speed over the C plus 1 over UC. And I even made this comment that this formula is a little different than what we saw with the Doppler effect because the Doppler effect did not consider the time dilation and length contraction and of course we sound waves were going slow and all of our objects were going slow compared to the speed of light we we didn't get that far but I did want to say here as we get started that conceptually it's still the same that is if I'm approaching an object the frequency is going to go up and if I'm going away from an object, the frequency is going to go down. And so there is this shift in the observed frequency because of motion. And so conceptually, our acoustics and our radio waves or our light waves, which are traveling at the speed of light, actually come out to be the same kind of conceptual idea. And I wanted to say that because you've probably have heard of red shifting. And this is how Hubble came to the conclusion that the universe was expanding because Hubble would look at these galaxies that are really far away, would take in the light spectrum coming in from these galaxies, and noticed that they were shifted to the red. 
Uh, in later chapters, we're going to talk a little bit more about quantum mechanics and learn that every atom has kind of this unique frequency that it gives off, and of course, in its reference frame. And so, he can know that and look up there and look at things like hydrogen and go, that should be at this frequency, but it's not. It's shifted. And he goes, oh, that's because it's moving, and it's moving away. And red is a lower frequency on the visible scale, as you, I think, remember from our optics, right? Your, your eyes can see from red to violet, and the low frequency is the red. So everything in the visible spectrum that Hubble measured looked a little more red than it should have. Now, I'm not saying it actually looked red, but it was all shifted. It was a red shift, and everything was on the spectrum towards the red, and that gave him the idea that everything's moving away from us, and that gave him the idea of the whole expanding of the universe and the, what we call the Big Bang and all those good things. Now, things that come close to us shift upward in frequencies. Um, we do have a few things like that. Most of the universe expands away from us, but uh, the closest galaxy, Andronema, does, because of gravity, come towards us. And so you look at the spectrum there, it's blue shifted uh, a, a little bit. Okay, it's shifted to the, to the higher frequencies. Um, if this is a radar signal, you could be moving towards it or away from it. And maybe you're familiar with that phrase, the uh, you know, Doppler radar. Uh, it's commonly used because you send out the radar, and not only does it reflect off of the raindrop so you know if it's raining, but as it reflects off, if the rain is in motion, so if the wind is blowing, which they always are in a storm, you can then pick up the shift in the frequency and then pick up how much, it, how much strong the wind is blowing. And if you can penetrate deep in it, some of the new radars can, you can get, okay, when the storm comes, the wind is going to be at this speed, but the middle of the storm, it's really fast, and you can pick up those speeds. Anyways, let's, let's read this problem. It's number 25. Let me kind of scale over here to number 25, but like I said, it thought it would give me a good chance to say a little bit more in the, from the lecture about this shift. Here it says we have a space probe and it's speeding towards the nearest star, moves at a quarter of the speed of light, and it sends a radio information at a broadcast of a frequency of one gigahertz. What frequency is received on the Earth? Okay, so if I were to do something like this, uh, let's see, this is this, what it say, it's a probe and it's going to some planet, a space probe sending towards the nearest star, okay, and so we're back here on Earth, but what I'm hoping to get at here is then I would say then this is moving away from me at some speed, which they gave as a quarter of the speed of light. So if I come over here and realize that this number is the one gigahertz, and let me pause there, because like all of our equations, they have two lengths or two times or two frequencies in them. And we need to pause and think about, okay, which one are they giving me? Are they giving me the proper or the non-proper? And which one are they asking for? So they're usually giving you one and asking for the other. But this one clearly says that the radio signal information broadcasts at. So in other words, if you were standing right next to the probe, when, when you were at Northrop Grumman building this probe, you would then be setting the frequency of this probe to one gigahertz. Right there, while you're next to it, while there's no motion. And so they're indirectly telling you this is the proper frequency. Okay, so then I can go 1 minus, and again, if you'll let me just kind of simplify the math by saying the speed of light would cancel off, the C's would cancel off, and then down here would be 1 plus 25. I can figure out what this new frequency is. Now, keep in mind it's moving away, and so this should be red shifted. In other words, this should shift to lower 
frequencies. So I will take the one and minus a quarter. I will divide it by, and I'll just do this in my head, 1.25. I will then take the square root, and I get about 0.77. And so when I multiply by 1, I am looking at 0.77 gigahertz, or 770 megahertz. Which is extremely important to know for, again, that engineer or that technician at, at JPL or at Northrop Grumman who says, okay, I want to get information. And if they were careless, they would go, okay, we built it at one gigahertz. And so they build a receiver, they tune it for one gigahertz, and they go, well, we're not getting a signal. We're not getting one gigahertz. Well, no, because it's been shifted down to 770 megahertz. So you need to then change your receiver not to be receiving one gigahertz, but to be receiving 770 megahertz. All right, well, let me keep going here. Let's try another one. How about number 35? I, I told you these are kind of, kind of straightforward ones, but the tricky part is knowing what the symbols are and which variable goes where. Uh, this one is talking about momentum. And uh, if you remember, although I went kind of quickly there in the lecture, saying, all right, without proof, uh, we would expect the equation for momentum to be a little different because of this length contraction and time dilation, this gamma factor I keep referring to. And I gave you this equation, that momentum is equal to gamma mv. And so that extra piece of motion. So 35 just says, find the momentum of a helium nucleus having a mass of and moving at, looks like, one-fifth the speed of light. All right. So I guess I should put here number 35. And I would say 1 over the square root of 1 minus. And again, we're only going one-fifth the speed of light. So this would be a 0.2 squared. So there's the extra gamma factor. And if you remember, this number is probably not very big. Even at 10%, uh, we were only at a, a half a percent increase. So I'd be curious what this number is. And I'm just going to write down the mass here so I can grab my calculator and put it in. But uh, this is 6.68 times 10 to the minus 27. So 6.68 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And when it comes to the homework or a test, you could do this in one big calculation. But I want to just break this apart. Starting with the gamma factor, I'm always curious about that. So it's 1 minus 0.2. Uh, squared, uh, taking the square root of that, and then taking the reciprocal. We're looking at 1.0206. So not a big change, 2%, but enough to keep in mind. Remember, he said anything greater than 10%, uh, we might want to think about, but it's only a 2% increase. Uh, the other thing I want to do here is maybe convert this back to units of momentum that we did last semester in physics 110 where we just did m times v. And so let me put it in kilogram meters per second. And so in this case, I actually want the value of, of c. And so I'm going to put in 3 times 10 to the 8th here. Uh, then I'll put 0.2. And then I will put 6.68 times 10 to the negative 27. And I got an error. Oh, I <laughs> typed that twice. Uh, but let me do it again. Uh, 3 times 10 to the 8th, 0.2, and 6.68 times 10 to the negative 27. And so this is 4.008 times 10 to the negative 19. And so the final answer says, go ahead and multiply that number by 
zero to so about a two percent increase and I get a four point zero nine one times ten to the negative nineteenth kilogram meters per second so you do see it kind of increase here because of the extra gamma factor so again at twenty percent the speed of light you wouldn't want to ignore it but not a significant factor but again like I said give me a chance to show you that calculation and, and show you the gamma factor yet again all right well two more here and we'll wrap it up let's try number 43 uh, 43 is what oh relativistic energy stuff yeah so this is at the end here we kind of rush right before the break it says what is the rest energy of electron given that its mass is and give your answers in joules and MeV oh yeah I wanted to do this because there's another unit of energy that we like to use when we're dealing with little tiny particles um, if you remember of course energy is measured in joules we've been doing that other sense physics uh, 110 and then we had joule energy here for all of our electronics and for our electricity our magnetism anything involving energy was always joules but there is another unit called an electron volt and an electron volt is a small amount of energy and it's a useful unit when we're dealing with small objects and so this is a very small object this is an, an electron and of course its definition if we go back to the beginning of our physics 111 here we said how much energy would you give an electron if you accelerated it between our two plates by one volt so we called that an electron volt and we calculated it out to be 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules uh, this comes from the charge times the voltage the charge of the electron is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs and then if you accelerate it with one volt and multiply it together you get 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 and if you remember a volt was a joule per coulomb the coulombs would cancel off and you get joule so our definition of an electron volt is the energy that one electron would get so there's the charge of the electron when you accelerated it in our parallel plates between one one volt so a mega electron volt would be of course a million times bigger than that going all the way back to chapter one and our prefixes of our metric system and so if I multiply this number by a million and remember a million is ten to the sixth and remember from your math class when you multiply you add exponents so if I add six here I get 10 to the minus 3 joules so that's my unit conversion and so that's what we're gonna work with here is how to convert my units all right so like I said a, a big part of doing this problem was to make sure you understood what a mega electron volts was and so we have to put together some past chapters here and so now I can do the rest mass so remember that the total mass is gamma mc squared but if we're talking about the rest mass in other words no motion involved V is 0 which means gamma is 1 and so we get E equals to mc squared and this is what I was talking about for the break that even a small amount of mass can actually be quite a bit of energy although this is an extremely small amount of mass this is one little tiny electron 
But let me start there with the mass of the electron. 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms is the mass of the electron. And the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And I'll square that. And I'll do the numbers in a second, but let's look at the units. This would be a kilogram meters squared over seconds squared. And I hope that rings in your mind a joule. And so by putting mass in kilograms and speed in meters per second, I would get my energy in, in joules. And uh, that, I think, would be your default. That's probably what you were thinking first. And that's, of course, what they asked. So I'll do that one first. And so let me go ahead and take 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31, and then times 3 times 10 to the 8th, and I'll square it. And so I get 8 point, uh, looks like 2, 0, times 10 to the negative 14 joules. And so that's the first half of the problem. What is the energy in, in joules? And I know it doesn't sound like a whole lot of energy, so I hope this isn't misleading. This is just an enormously small amount of mass. This is just one electron. But something the size, of, you know, maybe of a softball, remember, would be one kilogram. One kilogram times the speed of light would be nine times ten to the sixteen. One one softball would would have I'll, I'll call that nine times ten to the sixteen. Let me just call that nine to ten. That's ten to the seventeenth joules of energy. Whew, that's a lot of energy. All right, that's a hundred thousand trillion joules of energy in the mass of one softball. So, it's a lot. Okay, uh, with that in mind, I can now also use my conversion factor, and again, I'm thinking about chapter one here, by saying, if I take this number, 8.20 times 10 to the negative 14 joules, and I wanna convert it, remember, we just multiply by one. Because if we multiply by anything other than one, we would change its meaning. But it's got to be the appropriate one, and if you put joules in the bottom and mega electron volts in the top, then the joules would cancel off and you would be left with mega electron volts. Perfect. And that's what we would, would like here. Okay, and so the conversion factor I did over there, one mega electron volts was 1.602 times 10 to the negative, and I believe it's a 13 joules of energy. So taking this number that's already in my calculator and dividing it by 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19, I would get... Ah, I hit 19, not 13. So let me multiply by a million. Ah, divide by a million. Let me just try it again. 8.2 times 10 to the negative 14. Divided by 1.602 times 10 to the negative 13. Ah, much better. Should be about a half of MeV. And so the rest mass of an electron can be described as a half of MeV, or it can be described as this many joules. And so that's kind of useful. All right, one more, and then I think I've used my balance of time for this chapter. But like I said, your author wanted to introduce you guys because you're all scientists, and even though you're life scientists, you may not be coming as far in the physical world as this, but you should be exposed to what we call modern physics and relativity. And so that's why your author, and I should say special relativity, because there's another step in this general relativity where the, the thought process includes the effect of gravity. This, of course, uh, notice we didn't even talk about the effects of, of gravity. That's a whole nother discussion of itself. But this is, like I said, a good place to introduce you to the concept of special and even general relativity and how the world can be very different at these high speed or large gravitational fields.
So let me try number 54 and call it quits. Here it says an alpha decay. And that's again where we're headed because we're doing modern physics and these 30 years that shock physics, as I mentioned, uh, have radioactive decay involved. But here, one of the decays called an alpha decay is a nucleus decay in which a helium nucleus is emitted. If the helium nucleus has a mass of and is given this much kinetic energy, what is its velocity? Okay, if you remember, we worked out that the kinetic energy, whoops, well maybe I'll do that, total energy minus rest energy was equal to energy of motion. And I did that kind of quickly. But we came up with this. We came up with gamma minus 1 mc squared. If you did this, if you said the kinetic energy was equal to 1 half mv squared, you really missed the point of this chapter. Right? The point of this chapter was as we get greater than 10% the speed of light, more things begin to show up. I would say they're already there. They were just so small they weren't noticeable. And that's that gamma factor. That gamma factor was one when we had slow speed. But once we got to about 10% the speed of light, it increased by about a half a percent. And so if we're going to be true scientists, not just build the space shuttle. See, if we're just trying to be an engineer and, and build the space shuttle, we, we, we can say, look, uh, using gamma as a factor of one would work fine. We, we can get to the moon, and we did, without worrying about the gamma factor. But to really understand things, and things that go really fast, and right now we don't really have spaceships. We talk about these spaceships going half the speed of light, and that, that doesn't really happen in today's technology. Maybe someday, but, but not yet. But what we do have is a bunch of little tiny atomic particles that do go really close to the speed of light. And we got to factor that in when we build like the Large Hadron Collider. You know, how fast are they, they going? So when it go, says calculate the speed based on the speed of light, Notice that I'm going to use this equation, what I'll call the correct equation, not the slow speed approximation equation that we learned in physics 110. Okay, so now I got to come back here and put in my numbers. And sadly, you'll see that the math is a lot harder and you're going to wish you could just simply do one half mv squared. Uh, but they say that, uh, what do we have, a helium nucleus? and it's uh, five MeVs. All right, so over here, the kinetic energy, I'm gonna put five MeVs. Here, I'll put gamma minus one, and then I'll put in my MC squared. Now, I don't know if you see this coming, let me just get the mass down here, uh, 6.8 times 10 to the 27. But right here, when I write down 6.68 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, I'm beginning to see a unit problem, right? We've seen this all semester long and way back in Physics 110, we gotta make sure our units match. Because if I start doing kilograms and meters per second, I'm gonna get joules on this side. But over here, I have the energy in mega electron volts. So I need to make a decision which way to go. And I think what I'll do is go in the direction of joules. So let me take the speed here as 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and then square that whole quantity. And so this is going to be an energy in joules. In fact, I'll just get it right now. Grab my calculator here. So 6.68 times 10 to the negative 27 times 3 times 10 to the 8 squared 
And so this is 6.012 times 10 to the negative 10 joules. Now over here then, let me do a unit conversion. And uh, we said here that one MeV, so let me put MeV down in the bottom and joules in the top. I think I still have it over here. It should be the 1.602. 1 1.602 times 10 to the negative 13. So that the MeVs would cancel off. And so 1.602, I'll just go times a 5 because that'll give me 801, and then I'll have times 10 to the negative 13 joules. And of course now, I can solve for gamma minus one, when I then take this number, 8.01 times 10 to the negative 13, and divide it by this number, 6.012 times 10 to the negative 10. Okay. I was hoping this would turn out to be a higher speed, but I'll keep going. So this is a 0 0.00133, which means gamma is 1.00133. I don't know if you remember, but the 10% the speed of light was 1.005, right? And then we had 20% the speed of light, which I believe was a 1.02? Anyways, it's, it's, let me just calculate the speed, <laughs> okay, and see what it comes out to be. Uh, this is also gives me a chance to not only show you some algebra, but also, again, kind of a little trick that you can save yourself a lot of algebra if you write your speeds as a proportion of the speed of light. Now, sometimes you don't want to do that, like over here, trying to get it into energy here. But, but watch this for a moment. Let me just take gamma and square it. And say, I'm going to look for this ratio. And, and that's what they're, they're after here. So, let me just square. Whoops. Let me add 1 in my calculator first. Okay. So 1.00133. Let me square that. So this would be 1.00266. Let me bring this to the other side. So it's 1 minus V squared over C squared. And uh, then, if you kind of imagine distributing this, uh, well, maybe I better do it in steps. 1.00266 minus 1.00266 V squared over C squared equals 1. Then I can move this number to the other side, 1.00266. And I'm going to write it as V over C squared. Uh, by the way, you can kind of see now why I wanted to do the algebra for you. I'm trying to solve for the speed of light, but they've got this gamma factor. It's got this square root, and that's been challenging for students uh, in the, this level here. And so it, it needs to be seen here. Uh, now over here, if I subtract it, it's 0 0.00266. And so V over C squared would then be, let's see, 0 0.00266 divided by 1.00266. 
and I would get then 0 0.00265. I'll take the square roots of all of this. And I don't like my answer. I'm kind of thinking I have a small mistake over here. But this is a 0 0.05. And so my speed is 0 0.05 C, the speed of light. But I know that 10% comes out. Oh, 10% comes out to be point. Zero, zero, 005. Oh, I said it wrong. Okay, good. Now I feel better. So we are under 10% of the speed of light. Bummer. Yeah, like I said, I was kind of hoping for something a little bigger out of this, but maybe the realistic numbers. Anyways, so I do expect something under 10%, and sure enough, I got 5%. So this is saying 5% the, the speed of light. All right, well, I'll say bye for now. Hopefully those were helpful. Good luck on the homework. Bye now.